Good afternoon. My name is Turner Bitten. I'm the executive director here at Westview Media. Thank you for turning in to the next event in our series of candid candidate conversations. Uh, tonight, we're joined by Shireen Gorbani. I'd like to welcome you uh, on camera, Shireen. Hello, so happy to be with you. We are very glad that you are here. Um, before we get started, I'd like to just let folks who are watching live on Facebook know to please submit your questions for Shireen, um, and I'll do my best to ask all the questions that we get. Um, as we get started, Shireen, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, um, and kind of how you ended up where you are. I would be happy to. First, I want to take a moment just to thank you for hosting this forum. I know you've been doing many interviews with candidates, and I think in this time when we are really trying our best to um, adhere to you know, public health guidelines, reduce our um, interactions in public, um, these opportunities to talk about the race and you know, my own background and some of my priorities is deeply appreciated. So thank you for the efforts that you're doing to educate the public and give people opportunity um, to learn more about candidates. So um, I currently have the honor of representing all of Salt Lake County in the countywide seat. Um, there are three countywide seats on the Salt Lake County Council, and then there are six regional seats. Um, a handful of those are up this year, and I am the at-large candidate up this year. Um, and my uh, experience in politics is actually pretty new. Um, a little bit just about my own personal background. Um, I am a communications professional. My um, daily responsibilities are in training, uh, communication, really working on process improvement at the University of Utah in facilities management. So my professional life is really in what I often refer to as sort of the city managers of campus. Um, everything from our architects, engineers, to our uh, landscapers, to our um, arborists and uh, custodians. So we run a small city and many of the lessons that I've learned there and many of the things that I um, am passionate about in my work life are also things that I'm very interested and passionate about when we think about regional government like we have in Salt Lake County. Um, prior to that, I was a graduate student. I've taught um, classes uh, at the University of Utah and before that at the University of Nebraska. I have two master's degrees in organizational communication with an emphasis in policy. I'm a community volunteer. I was a Peace Corps volunteer from 2003 to 2005 in the Republic of Moldova, where I did work on community and economic development and specifically worked on issues of gender. Um, my, I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to work on some anti-trafficking work, um, work closely on women and girls leadership programs, um, breast cancer, HIV, AIDS awareness, um, just some good public health kind of uh, work in, in Moldova, which was a, a place that desperately needed it. Um, and then, uh, you know, before that, or I guess I should say in terms of some of my other volunteer commitments, I am an active member of the board member of the Rape Recovery Center and have spent over the last about 15 years doing work on everything from crisis lines to hospital response work, um, supporting victims, uh, people who've been victimized by sexual violence. So that's uh, something that I'm also very passionate about. Um, doing that kind of work in our community has been um, something that has uh, really opened my eyes to the depth of the problems around um, and the challenges I think that victims face in seeking justice in particular when it comes to sexual violence. So. Um, that's just kind of a little bit about me. I'm a, a mom. I have a, a four-year-old. I'm, I'm married. Um, I'm sorry, a five-year-old who's who's now in kindergarten, and uh, my husband's a teacher um, in the Catholic school system here in um, in the county. Thank you. Um, I'd like to come back to some of the community work that you've done, but before that, let's talk uh, about how you came to be on the county council. Uh, one of my very favorite, as I was preparing. For our conversation, one of my very favorite things that I read about you was an article in City Weekly. And I believe <laughs> the headline was The Unsinkable Shireen Gorbani. Uh, so yeah. why don't you tell us how you came to the County Council and sure. what, how you decided to run for office in the first place? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so I am a person who deeply believes that we should have expanded access to health care for, you know, for people living in this country. I am a person who was really motivated to get involved with politics after a personal experience um, in 2016, the summer of 2016, I lost my mom to pancreatic cancer. And it happened fast and furious. Um, I hope nobody tuning in has had the unfortunate experience of having 
a loved one or someone they know diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, but it's a river. Um, it went really fast for us. The average lifespan for a person diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer is about three and a half months. Um, and only 7% of the people who are diagnosed survive. Um, and we learned um, you know, quickly and personally how quickly families can lose everything with one diagnosis. Um, my mom was also a teacher. She raised me by herself. Um, often, you know, the kind of person who uh, at the beginning of each month, I remember her sitting down with her, um, you know, paycheck and her um, bills coming in and really fighting to uh, balance that budget in her household. I know we lived really close to the edge. We were really lucky to have stable housing and stable, and she was lucky to have stable employment, um, but she didn't have healthcare. We didn't have um, healthcare when I was growing up. And it's something that really marked many experiences of my upbringing that I remember and carry with me to this day. Um, but anyway, in, in the summer of 2016, um, she was diagnosed in June and she took her last breath in August. And in that span of time, things happened so quickly for us that I remember, um, you know, worrying about things like what I would have to do to get her the kind of care that she needed. Would I have to sell off, you know, our her Nissan Versa? You know, would I have to look at ways that I could um, try to find resources myself? Um, and we were very lucky because she was 68. So my mom was on Medicare and we didn't have to make many of the difficult decisions that I know other people were making. Um, in the hospital, I just remember walking the halls at night sometimes to just catch um, some time alone or some fresh air and hearing, you know, family members having really difficult financial conversations on the phone as their loved one was fighting for their lives. And that reality was untenable to me. Um, and I remember coming through that experience, being so grateful for Medicare and what it had meant for my family, um, that the conversations, the last conversations I had with my family, with my mother, were not about what we could sell off to get her the care that she needed. And from that moment forward, I really thought, you know, I, I need to do something more in the space of healthcare. And really fighting to expand access to healthcare is what drove me to run for office. I um, started kind of looking around at opportunities in my um, community and largely from my city council person up to my um, state senator, I was represented by people who shared the same values that I did and in particular were fighting to protect or even expand access to healthcare. And I noticed that my um, representative in the United States House of Representatives, uh, Chris Stewart, was a person who'd voted against the Affordable Care Act really every chance he got. And the thing that was more um, disturbing to me was that he wasn't coming to the table with solutions on how to uh, fix it. You know, how do, we, how do we drive down the cost? How do we expand access? It just simply wasn't a priority. And the more I told my story and the more I met with people around this state, the more I understood that access to health care was their story too. Um, struggles around, um, in particular, mental health care, accessing mental health care. I haven't, I don't know that I can say I've met a Utah that hasn't been personally impacted by um, suicide or by addiction. And those stories just kept kind of following, like adding into my passion for really fighting for the kind of care and, and access to care that people need. So I didn't win uh, the second congressional uh, district race, but I had just the most incredible time and I could not be more grateful for what the opportunity of knocking on the doors of, you know, thousands of residents across the state, really talking personally to hundreds and hundreds of voters, what, what that did in terms of shaping my deepening my commitment and passion to finding a way to serve our community in elected office. So after that election, um, there was a special election for the Salt Lake County mayor. I ran for that, uh, came within 77 votes. It was a um, delegate race uh, and that uh, didn't pan out. And I thought, well, that's it um, because I do work full time. Um, I'm not independently wealthy. I, you know, I have uh, bills to pay and, and, and love my job. Um, and uh, my boss was willing to work with me to uh, be able to reduce my hours. So I was able to go to uh, 32 hours a week, take Tuesdays off, and in that um, was able to run for the county council seat and have just been um, honored by the absolute privilege to serve our community um, and really tackle some you know, difficult questions. I think one thing that many people don't think about when we think about Salt Lake County government 
is that we're the largest uh, provider of mental health care, um, access to addiction treatment services in the state, just based on population. So many of the majority, you know, so many Utahns live uh, right here along the Wasatch Front and certainly even more um, densely populated here in Salt Lake County with over a million residents. Um, we have people, you know, from all corners of this county seeking access to care, addiction treatment services and mental health care services are a huge part of the human services element of county government. And I'm so proud of the work that's happening there. Thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate that. And I, I, I now want to give you the opportunity to, to say what you think the most important role that Salt Lake County or that the Salt Lake County Council plays in this system that you've talked about. Yeah, so the the real um, core of the responsibility of of the council is uh, is a fiduciary responsibility. So really understanding how you know the budget will come together, approving the budget, understanding what the needs are, where we need to shift resources, and we have regional services in this county, unlike many counties in the country. So when we think about things like our art spaces, uh, a new art center that's going into Taylorsville, a Bravenal Hall, uh, the Hale Center Theater, when we think about even uh, you know beyond that, um, a very large county library system, when we think about our senior centers that have been critical in connecting seniors to food and resources through this pandemic, there are just layers on layers on layers of the of the value that county government and county entities bring to the residents of, of the region. And that's putting aside, you know, our investment in parks and open spaces and really the bulk of our um, responsibilities and the bulk of what we fund is in uh, criminal justice and public safety. So uh, everything from the work that happens uh, in our courts, our legal defenders, uh, the district attorney's office, on and on throughout the entire system around criminal justice services. There's so much investment and so much work that happens in that space. So really thinking about what we're doing to lead and to be fiscally responsible when it comes to investing in programs that, um, you know, my priority is always when we can find ways that we're saving taxpayer dollars over the long run. I'd rather, um, you know, invest in the right kinds of programs, the right kinds of uh, interventions and not have to continue to pay for something over and over and over again. Um, and so I would say that's, you know, that's the core responsibility and it's a really important responsibility. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to give you a break for just a second because we've asked you three rapid succession questions. Um, and remind folks that are watching live, if you have a question for Shireen, please submit it in the chat and we'll be sure to ask it. Um, to kind of build up to the next question, um, as you approach all these different issues that you've mentioned, uh, Salt Lake County Council is a part-time job and you have a full-time job. How do you or how have you found time to balance it all? And, and how do you, I, I, when, when, as I was doing research for this, you are very active on social media, providing information to constituents. So just kind of wondering how you balance it all. And you mentioned you have a five-year-old on top of all of that. <laughs> I do. So, um, you know, it's been a real change for me. I um, certainly spend less time with my friends. I unfortunately, you know, find that I am working often late into the evenings. I spend um, you know, less time with my family than I did before um, getting into um, public service. But I've also really made a commitment to try to find opportunities to bring my son with me um, to events if I'm able to, obviously in, a, in the before, right, in a pre-COVID world. Um, but I, I just take it very seriously. I believe that this is a privilege. It's an honor to serve our community. And I think part of my responsibility is to push information back out to people so they can understand. Um, that's been incredibly important in COVID. So from the very beginning, um, as I was getting updates from the County Health Department, um, understanding, um, learning, you know, more and more about um, COVID-19 uh, interventions, what we need to be doing. And then on top of that, opportunities for small businesses, grant programs to nonprofits, different things that we're doing in the efforts to preserve both lives and livelihoods here in Salt Lake County. I just uh, really did, I guess, um, what I kind of always do, which is try to get information out consistently um, to the community. So 
you know, making videos. Um, an, another priority for me is whenever possible to make those videos accessible. So I try to use captions, try to use, um, you know, descriptions to make sure that uh, many people can access that information. Um, if I, you know, uh, as a council person, I have one staff person who supports me in the office full time. And then I am technically part time, but I don't know any public servant who really does the work who finds it to be a part time experience. Um, but one of the things that I would like to do is really further explore ways that I can increase language access. I think it's um, important knowing that, you know, our, our most commonly spoken languages, we've got certainly Spanish and followed by Chinese, I believe in this state, um, it would be incredible to just be working personally on ways that I can increase access um, through multilingual channels, because I know that we're missing um, people who need critical information, but relying on community partners, uh, you know, tapping into groups um, and, and really trying to share messages. Something that comes to mind is, uh, the pandemic EBT, so the opportunity for people who were seeking um, th that already applied for for SNAP, um, there were there was an additional opportunity to support kids, and I you know took it upon myself to connect with Utahns Against Hunger. They were able to send me some information, put together a video, and then I try to go through and find community groups and share that video and push that information out um, because I think we should expect our um, elected officials to be providing critical information out in digestible bites and formats. Um, and it's, it's something I really try to do. Well, thank you. Um, and I, I certainly recognize the amount of hard work you do to communicate. Uh, it was quite fun to, to look at all the different things. Um, you are in the middle of an election, um, running for re-election. And I wanted to just ask what you think is the biggest issue in your race. Yeah, so I there there are a number of issues, of course, that continue to challenge uh, Salt Lake County as a whole. Issues around growth, you know, access to mental health care, as I mentioned, is something I'm very passionate about. Addressing, you know, our um, concerns around uh, homelessness, the investments that we're making for our unsheltered um, community members. Um, but right now, it's hard for me to think totally outside of the response to the pandemic. So our, um, you know, a large part of my time at the council right now is navigating, uh, you know, very difficult financial situation that the county certainly faces as a result of uh, the impacts of this pandemic. Um, but kind of above and beyond that, the thing I'm always thinking about is what interventions, information, um, testing services, uh, how we're working to save lives um, and really not put people in a in a in a you know in in situations unfortunately, like we're seeing now, where we're seeing a real spike again in our community. Um, but Salt Lake County was one of the first counties to move forward with a mask mandate. And that was driven by the data, um, understanding that that simple uh, act of <laughs> wearing a mask, I always carry mine around, um, you know, has the ability to reduce the spread in our community. Um, prioritizing uh, the right public health response is also prioritizing the economic response and making sure that those numbers come back down quickly is something I'm, I'm you know, worried about and uh, have been in frequent communication with our health department on what people need to do. And I, I, I know that some people are probably watching this right now, so I'll just kind of go through what people need to understand is that the risk of contracting COVID right now in Salt Lake County um, is, uh, is at a high and what, that means is the, um, you know, the frustration that we have with the prolonged nature of this pandemic, but those large group gatherings, um, you know, being uh, in, especially inside with large groups is not advisable at this time. Um, you can go to the Salt Lake County website and really get a sense of where um, our numbers are going and it's not moving in the right direction right now. And so we need every member of this community to go back to those core kind of public health recommendations, you know, limit interactions in public when you can, wash your hands, wear the mask, social distance, um, really do what you can to play your part in bringing our numbers back down. 
Thank you. Um, the next question I'd like to ask, so as a member of the county council, you represent the entire county and you're working with uh, a bunch of different constitutional offices and the mayor's office. So I just wanted to ask kind of what your experience has been like and how you navigate all those different relationships. Uh, and kind of to add on top of that question, uh, these are partisan races. So what is it like to have to work across the aisle at a time like this in, in our history? So one of the really nice things about county government is I do think at a time when we see really a lot of chaos and gridlock at the federal level, on a weekly basis, we get work done at the county council. Um, we meet every Tuesday. We are working almost um, the vast majority of the time. The votes that we take are unanimous. They are um, kind of beyond partisanship. And I'll say that's something that I really appreciate and value about my colleagues technically across the aisle. I would say ideologically, some of the members that maybe um, I, I might be the furthest from, we find common ground on issues like sustainability, open space, uh, you know, protecting and investing in trails. Um, there's a lot of shared goals, um, especially in the criminal justice space as well. Uh, really making investments that improve people's lives is not um, at the county level a partisan issue. We've got a lot of support to do good work in, in the space of criminal justice and criminal justice reform, much um, that has happened even before my time on the council. So there's, there's something kind of nice about it. And one of the things that I did when I knew I was interested in running for county government is I went and I met. I met with you know, heads of departments. I met with the elected officials, sat down with people, um, you know, some who had been, have been doing this job for, for a while, you know, have been serving the community and in these roles for a long time. And in some ways, I think it's kind of silly that these are partisan races. Um, these are, you know, talented people, uh, uh, happen to be, you know, some Democrats, some Republicans, but many people who prioritize really excellent work on behalf of the residents of this county. And it's it's really an honor to serve. And in some ways, I think it's kind of hopeful, um, given how uh, uh, divisive and, and toxic um, some of our political environment is right now. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give you a break for just a second because we asked okay. multiple questions in a row. Um, and remind folks watching on Facebook, if you have questions uh, for Shireen, please submit them and we'll be sure to ask them. We did get uh, an audience question from Jessica and first she wanted you to know, um, she said, thank you for talking about your mom. She also lost her mom uh, due to cancer. It looks like back in 2018, uh, but she wanted to ask, what advice do you have for advocates, particularly women who are looking to, to make a difference on policy? Oh, wow. Such a good question. And I'm so sorry about the loss of your um, mom. It's not something I wish on anyone. It's really, um, thanks for sharing that. Um, the, so what I would say is there are some groups that are doing excellent advocacy work. Um, it, I, I don't know, there's no more detail, like not asking specific policy work. Nope. I, okay. I it's just general about getting involved. Great, no problem. So there are a couple of things that come to mind immediately. One is I, um, you know, I get a lot of questions. I'm sort of personally most active on Instagram. I try to share a lot of information there. That's one place where um, if you find people who are active on Twitter, they're active on Instagram, um, you can, you know, message them. Uh, sometimes there, I respond to messages that come into me, but. Um, you know, start that conversation. And then I think really quickly, especially if you're interested in, in kind of fine level policy work, switch that over to a county email or set up time for a phone call. I had a phone call today with a constituent in Cottonwood Heights where we had a pretty deep and um, really informative, interesting conversation about, you know, trailhead management and uh, road investments. And I was so happy to do that. And I'm so grateful anytime somebody really reaches out and is interested in, in advancing solutions on some of the big challenges that we face. Um, the other thing I would say is if you're not already linked up with Action Utah, I highly recommend getting involved with Action Utah. They are a nonpartisan group working on, um, you know, good policy on behalf of uh, Utahns. And I find that they do such good, um, I guess I would say kind of like two things, issue advocacy training, and then also just informing to let people know what's coming, how to get involved. Um, they, 
really do wonderful work. Um, the League of Women Voters is another place where you can get involved. Um, they do a lot of really, I think, important work, especially around election, um, you know, advocacy information. They were doing a lot of anti-gerrymandering work in 2018. Um, they're phenomenal and just such a cool group to get involved with. And then I think, you know, I recommend reaching out to your representative and, and asking, I've had a couple of people come and shadow me for a day or, um, you know, follow along on a particular topic or issue that they care about. Um, and, and that's a great way to kind of get involved too and just see, I know um, my legislator, I know um, legislators have been really welcoming to constituents up on the Hill and that's a real treat. So if you can do that, I would recommend building those relationships. See if you can find um, other groups maybe too that are working on that issue that matters to you. I know I've reached out, I haven't actually had too much success, but I've, I've reached out to the pancreatic cancer community here in Utah, wanna know what I can do to advocate and work with them. And I'd given the example previously, I'm, I'm very passionate about ending hunger, you know, collaborating with Utahns Against Hunger. So find that issue and then see if you can connect with a, a nonprofit that might be working in that space or an advocacy group that might be working in that space um, because they will give you the guide on how to get involved. Um, but again, thanks for the question. It's always exciting when people are like, how do I do more? <laughs> Thank you. And I made sure that I put those uh, links in the chat. So if you're watching, you can click through to the two organizations that Shereen mentioned. Um, then we got another audience question as I was typing and it's from Ma who asked, what is your stance on police reform? Yeah, so we have to, so, so much more has to happen in the space around police reform. And I know that there has been uh, both sort of a national conversation happening, but also conversations happening at the local level. For me, um, this is an issue I'm passionate about. I'm also the county, as a county council person, I, we don't have, direct jurisdiction over a, a police department. That countywide service comes to unified and the unified police um, have their own board. So it's important to understand kind of that distinction in terms of what I have the capacity to do in the seat that I sit in. But certainly greater accountability and transparency. I think one of the things that's just really been on my mind in a space where I have the ability to push the narrative and really think about what community safety looks like is we have to reckon with the um, true lack of, well, not lack, the, the very limited resources that we have in the mental health crisis response space. We lose far too many Utahns to a mental health crisis and we know that it is a pervasive issue when it comes to um, police brutality and, and really some of the most dangerous situations that we see in our community when it comes to policing. So expanding access to mental health care, especially in the crisis response arena, is a place where the county has a, a big role already and needs to be expanded. And I think the place where we're seeing a real lack, or I personally feel like we have a real lack of services in the community, is for youth crisis response. Um, the situation that um, the, the video was just released with the 13 year old um, who was shot, uh, you know, luckily survived um, coming up on about a month ago now. Um, we simply do not have the infrastructure to respond to uh, the number of kids in mental health crisis in our in our county, in our state. So those are some places where I have the ability to really push for those resources and to try to find um, solutions. And we have some exciting ones on the horizon. A crisis receiving center was approved. Um, it's a you know an effort that uh, the county has been working on for a long time. Funding has been coming just this last year from the state legislature. Um, but we certainly need greater transparency in um, the in across all of the, um, I guess this is where it gets complicated. So in Salt Lake County, we have so many different police departments, right? So um, different municipalities often have their own and we have Unified as well that kind of has a more regional response to some of the bigger things. Accountability, transparency, um, you know, uh, civilian review boards that have uh, some actual teeth uh, are, are all things that I uh, support and would like to see. I also think that it's important that when we're moving these 
uh, conversations forward about what needs to happen in the reform space, that it's something that we're pushing on um, regionally. Um, and the reason that that matters is because sometimes we have, as you know, when we've had large um, events, police uh, departments from all across the county might respond. And so it's important to me that all of those different municipalities would be requiring the same kinds of de-escalation training, transparency, accountability, um, and structures in place to make sure that when somebody is called you know, in from any of our other municipalities to respond in any other one, that there would be a real continuity in the way that the public um, would be interfacing uh, with, with our police. So those, those are some things that are important um, to me in that, in that space. And I think from where I sit and the opportunities that I have, I'm really thinking about kind of, I would say the, I don't wanna say they're bigger, but the sort of overlying issues around mental health care, you know, access to safe communities, what community safety really means. And to me, that's tied often to things like stable housing, um, access to health care, good jobs, all of those things are tied into what true community safety looks like to me. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give you another break and just remind folks we're running toward the end of the prepared questions that I have. So if you have additional questions, uh, we're nearing the part of the interview where we'll depend on your questions. Um, so if you have one, be sure to submit it into the chat. Um, kind of building on the last question about police reform, um, and we, you can answer it at a 10,000 foot level, but I, I'm just wondering, as, as you've been looking at the COVID response and on the county council, what do you feel can be done to promote more equity in Salt Lake County? Yeah, so a lot needs to be done. What we know right now is that uh, a child born on the west side has uh, a 10 year shorter life expectancy than a child born on the east bench. We know that when we think about things like the way that um, COVID has impacted our community, and I wanna say clearly there have been efforts to reverse or to, to lessen the impact that we've seen in our communities of color, but the many systemic consequences of racial inequity that we saw around the county also played out here. Um, something that I mentioned before, I'm a, a big advocate for access to healthcare and have been working to see what we can do to increase access, especially for children in our county. Um, Utah is the second highest state in the nation for children rolling off of health insurance. Um, we also know that of the about 75,000 kids, 40% uh, of them are Latinx. When we look at that and we look at what was happening, um, especially early on with our um, COVID response, I was the first person to ask what our plan was in particular for our, for our Latinx community, um, how we were gonna do outreach, what we were going to see if we had already seen a disproportionate impact in our communities of color because that's what we were seeing across the nation. So those were questions that I asked early on and really tried to figure out what we could do to increase and have a, you know, culturally appropriate and embedded responses to address problems, frankly, that we knew were there already, right? So one of the things that I think COVID-19 has done is it has just shown a, a bright light on the way that systemic inequities, often racial inequities in our community are, um, Overlap. There, there, there are just many layers of, of need and resources I think that we need to be prioritizing going forward. Um, the other thing that we know is that when it comes to pollution, some of our worst, um, the residents who live with some of the most uh, concentrated elements of pollution uh, from our air quality, those are also our communities of color. And these are real concerns that I think over time have been uh, neglected when we think about what a real investment in, again, kind of back to this idea of community safety or racial equity really means, right? So some of the things that I think are important are really in understanding what we're doing in terms of prioritizing our resources around response, right? So um, I've been asking a lot about what we're doing to make sure that going forward, um, especially in our um, as we're planning for a vaccine, oh, I've got a visitor. <laughs> um, as we're planning for a vaccine, making sure that we're prioritizing 
those communities that we know are hardest hit, whether that's um, intergenerational living, our frontline workers, um, who are disproportionately also, uh, you know, members of our communities of color. Um, what are we doing to really ensure that sense of equity in the COVID response? That's something that's important to me. It's something that I've been pushing for. But then beyond that, you know, where do we have opportunities to further expand and invest in open spaces to really make sure that we've got good trail access to do what we can to reduce? Um... <laughs> Sorry, you got to go out. Yeah. Um, then you got to be quiet. Okay. This is how you balance it. You just do everything all at once. Um, so really making sure that when we're thinking about things like investing in, um, uh, you know, ex expanded opportunities for childcare in our um, rec centers. You know, it's important to me that we're prioritizing the communities that need it the most. Um, so those are, you know, real questions that I that I ask, um, you know, priorities that I have um, when we're thinking about what we can do to really address um, inequities that have, I think, for too long gone ignored in our community. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll give you a break for just a second um, and check for additional questions. Uh, okay, I don't see that. Any, I don't see any additional ones. Um, so I, I'd like to jump back to something we talked about right at the very beginning, and this is your background working in uh, sexual violence and and with the Rape Recovery Center. I just um, wondering if you've had an opportunity while you've been on the county council to continue that work and what what that kind of looks like and how that experience is carried forward to the county council. Yeah. So our um... One thing that came up last year is we, let me, first of all, I want to give a shout out to um, Representative Angela Romero and many others who've been working to uh, address the backlog of uh, the, the rape kits in our state. Um, we, um, in the kind of on the volunteer side, so going back a few years, um, you know, one of the big problems that people that people experience kind of coming into uh, if they had experienced sexual violence and then they were thinking about, you know, do I file a report? Do I get evidence collected? It was very disheartening and very, it's a very, um, it can be a, a re-traumatizing experience. It can be a very difficult experience for people to go through. And knowing that, um, you know, was kind of disincentive enough, but then to know that potentially you would, you know, go through this process, have evidence collected, and it would just sit for such a long time was really, um, again, discouraging for um, people who had experienced sexual violence. So that change um, in our state um, led forward by, you know, powerful women, um, in particular, Representative Romero, but many others who had worked on the issue um, is, is something that I think we should all be celebrating. And I'm personally very grateful for the end of the backlog in our rape kits. But on that, um, as people, you know, work to seek justice in our criminal justice system, we do not um, move quickly enough. And uh, last year during our budget cycle, one of the things that was on the table was, um, and actually led by Mayor Wilson, was an increase of resources for our special victims response, um, our special victims unit in the district attorney's office, who come at the work of sexual violence in a very trauma-informed way, really working with people um, who've experienced, you know, often a, 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 what can be a very, um, just, Trauma, trauma has many different impacts on people's brains and, and thinking about kind of how you move through a criminal justice process in response to that takes a really special talent and skill. And I fought for expanding access for that, that team, for the special victims unit, so that we would not leave our victims of sexual violence waiting for, um, you know, sometimes over three years for their day in court. That's an unacceptable amount of wait time for me and really understanding what it means to move that system a little bit faster is, is resources. So I fought to expand those ac you know, access to, um, I guess, to uh, support funding for four additional SVU lawyers that would be in the district attorney's office. Uh, two were initially approved and funded and then we did fight and ultimately get the support for the others. But that, um, you know, I was surprised it was a fight. Because again, as I mentioned earlier, I, I really don't know Utahns that aren't touched by um, addiction or by uh, often suicide or, or you know struggles with mental health. 
it's very rare to meet a Utahn that doesn't also have, you know, either personal or one degree of separation away experience um, with sexual violence. We unfortunately have a very high rate of sexual violence in this state. We have a very high rate of um, child sexual abuse in this state. When uh, victims, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, move into, uh, when they move into our criminal justice space, they should not have to wait years and years and years for justice. So that was something that um, I was happy to see a little bit of forward movement on, but I know that many victims still wait too long. Thank you. Um, the next question I'd like to get to came from an audience member named Jamaica, and she asks, uh, if you would just talk about ways that you think air quality can be improved. Yeah, so um, air quality, so as I mentioned, I work in facilities management at the University of Utah. That gives me some additional insight into what can happen, and this is um, so nerdy, but it's so true that it's really important that we invest in you know, cleaning up our own house. So making sure there's, there's been efforts to do, um, you know, building assessments, understand what role Salt Lake County plays when it comes to our own buildings and our facilities in our airshed. There's been good investments and, um, you know, steps forward in cleaning up our buildings. Really, um, our new buildings certainly are operating at a very high standard when it comes to um, emissions and air quality but there's always work to be done in that space. We can also do more in operations. And I was really glad to see Mayor Wilson move forward with a sustainability lead person in, in, her, um, in her portfolio, in her office, that's working on looking at, you know, every, like our emissions when it comes to our, our own vehicles, uh, the way that we are, um, you know, uh, manicuring, the way that we're, um, taking care of our, our parks, uh, the uh, different vehicles or the tools that we might be using and what those do to contribute to air quality. So those are some in-house things that the county's working on, in some cases has been working on for a number of years. But then we also have kind of larger scale investments. So things like um, the solar array at the Salt Palace or uh, looking for other investments in ways that we can offset our carbon footprint. There's so much to be done in this space. Um, but I think, you know, um, through our health department, we also have um, different opportunities and programs available, whether that's uh, energy efficient light bulbs. Um, sometimes we're partnering with the senior centers to help people exchange their light bulbs for more efficient light bulbs um, and, and other um, small but meaningful things, um, you know, helping uh, in residents of this county purchase electric, um, lawnmowers, if possible, um, you know, providing support uh, for people who have only wood burning um, heat in their home who are interested in making that transition over. So some of these are programs that are seasonal or that we've run at different points in time. Some are ongoing programs at the county, um, but there's really so much that we can be doing, I think, to lead out on sort of showing what we can do internally. And one of the one of my favorite things to do is to visit our um, health department location in Murray, where the um, employees there have just made such an incredible commitment to showing what um, a sustainable office can look like. And some of the investments that they've made there are really exciting. Um, but, you know, I think kind of above and beyond that, when we're thinking about things like how our county grows, making sure that um, mass transit, alternate modes of transit, um, parks, you know, trails, all of that is prioritized when we're thinking about additional developments or growth around the county. So that's something that's really important to me. Thinking about what we're going to do as we see increased demand on our canyons. Um, how do we get people there? How do we get people up into our canyons without having to take that car, um, you know, sometimes far across the county and then up into our canyons? Um, I think people have really come to understand the value of open space and uh, what it has meant, especially as we're navigating COVID um, in terms of mental health and quality of life. So how do we continue to um, invest in our open spaces and public lands and uh, create ways for people to get there that doesn't contribute to some of our airshed problems? So those are all conversations that we're having, um, things that I'm excited to see move forward and, and places where we frankly need also more investment, but it's always an issue of prioritizing and wanting to really deliver value back to um, the residents of this county for the tax dollars they put in. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna give you another break because that was a couple of long questions. Uh, and remind the audience to, to please submit questions. This will be the last time that I ask for, for questions to be submitted. So if you have one, 
that you've been sitting on, be sure to submit it in the chat. Um, we did receive another question, and this one was from Rob, um, and he asked specifically about the Olympia Hills development, but mm -hmm. I think what I'll do, if it's all right, is expand that to be more of a 10,000 foot view of, of how you view growth in the county. Yeah, so this is certainly one of the biggest challenges we face as a state. One of the ongoing kind of questions and concerns I think that we have when we're thinking about future development is everything from water to, as I mentioned, infrastructure around transportation, um, infrastructure around, uh, you know, everything from um, stormwater systems to uh, how we're going to build communities that can respond to a, a really significant growth that we're seeing and that we know continues to come. Um, and again, kind of a COVID data point, um, you know, people are moving to Utah and uh, frankly, the majority of our growth is internal. Um, I think it's about two thirds of the growth that we are anticipated to see by 2050 are our own children, our own families. Um, and I think one of the things that's really lovely about Utah is it's a place where you can still um, have big families. We've got a, a large middle class, you know, many people that um, value a, a big family. And, and that's something that's certainly very um, tender and unique about, about Utah. But it also means that we have a, a growth challenge. I, as I mentioned, knocked on hundreds of doors across this county in 2018. And one of the things that just struck me over and over again was how many families I met that were living intergenerationally and not because they didn't have good jobs, um, simply because they couldn't find uh, rent and save enough money to either buy a house or find a home that was in their price range. Um, we, you know, uh, recent estimates suggest that there are 40, uh, that we're 40,000 units short when it comes to uh, what people are looking for. And, um, you know, I know that there are real questions and concerns when it comes to density and, uh, you know, com planned communities. One of the things I think that was important to me and is important to me going forward is that we are really making um, demands on our on developers. I think a big plan is better than a piecemeal, a piecemeal plan. And that we're asking people to invest in parks, open space, trails, um, really address some of those infrastructure problems. But as a state, we're behind when it comes to investing in the road infrastructure um, and alternative modes of transportation that could really help reduce the strain on our roads. Um, you know, corners of this county are growing really fast. Um, I live in a high density uh, corner of this county. Um, and really those investments in alternate modes of transportation, open space, trails, allowing people to use active transportation, many of those things are a priority for me when we're thinking about the very limited land that we have left. Um, and it's important to me that people can, you know, that they can continue to have families and that those families can live here. Um, those are all some of the tensions and I think some of the challenges that we face when we think about growth. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to start drawing us to a close. So what I'd like to do now is give you a chance. What's your website? How can people contact you? Um, if they want more information about your candidacy, where can they find you? So the website is Team Shireen, um, T E A M S H I R E E N dot com. Um, so you can find the uh, some information on how to contact me there. Um, if you've got a concern as a member of the county that is kind of just everyday business, you can certainly find me on the Salt Lake County website and the county email is just shireen at slco.org. So that's the, the county email if you have questions as a constituent. As um, with a, a name like Shireen Gorbani, I'm pretty easy to find on uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, it's all the same, just at Shireen Gorbani, and then you'll find me there. Um, and I, I guess one of the things that I hope people will do is really, um, you know, please do vote. Um, we have so much on the line here in these elections at the local level, all the way up, of course, to the federal level. And um, you can go to vote.utah.gov right now and check your voter registration, which I highly recommend everyone does. Um, if you've moved, um, you can easily update that information online. 
but um, I believe the deadline is, um, I want to say it's uh, right around October 20th for updating your information online to receive your ballot in the mail. So please jump on now, go to vote.utah.gov, check your um, voter registration, make sure it's active, make sure the address is correct. And if you live in, well, if you live in Utah, a ballot will arrive in the mail. Thanks, Shereen. And you're right. The deadline to register is October 23rd. Great. To October 23rd. Yeah. D but do it today. And we, we put that link in the chat so you can go and do that uh, as soon as we're done with this video, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, the last question I'd like to ask you uh, before we wrap up is, is there any question or issue that I should have brought up today that I didn't? Oh, my goodness. I feel like I was able to kind of touch on everything. Um, let me think. Um, I, I think I'll just say that one of the things that's been, I, I know this time has been difficult and it's been um, isolating for some. So one of the things that I think I just wanna make sure that people know about are, are just the extensive resources that we have um, in terms of organizations that are really trying to work to respond to uh, support people with their mental health at this time. Um, but one of the things that you can do as a friend is just reach out to people that you haven't heard from that much of. Or if you kind of see, honestly, my own social media is like, there, there are so many inputs, it's sometimes kind of hard to, to figure out who I haven't heard from in a while or who seems not to be doing so well. But I can, I can just say one of the things that I value about my community here, and I think more more broadly Utahns is that we we do have big hearts and we are willing to you know check in on our neighbors and make sure that people are doing okay um, but it continues to be a difficult time and I think especially as we're seeing increased COVID numbers people will hopefully um, you know be spending more time at home again the contact that you have with your neighbors the efforts that you make to reach out to um, loved ones people you haven't heard from that much uh, uh, you know, recently, that those small efforts can really go a long way to helping people with their overall mental health. We also have a couple of statewide resources. So um, the National Suicide Prevention um, line brings in, connects you to local um, local responders, and then we also have a state warm line, and that's pretty new. Um, I'm going to forget the number off the top of my head here, head here but I'll go in and, and add it in the comments of this. Um, event, but we have so many resources that are just a phone call away. The um, Utah chapter of the American Suicide Prevention Foundation does a lot of good work on connecting people to resources. Um, Uni has a warm line as well, and, and there are just absolutely so many great um, resources in the space. And lastly, I'll just plug the Safe Utah app. So the Safe UT app, um, that's something you can download to your phone. Please share that information with others. Um, I, I just worry that these next few months, um, especially heading into the winter, could be really difficult and just a further strain on people's mental health. So please um, check in on your loved ones and share those resources. Well, thank you, Shireen. I really appreciate your time tonight. And thank you for your public service and for running for office, uh, especially during such a, what I'm sure is a weird election uh, and a weird time to be running for office. But we really appreciate your time tonight. Yep. I, thank you for having it. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.